Hello everyone. Very, very warm welcome to the 39th webinar of our NZEB knowledge series. This is a platform for industry to share their expertise, projects, products, technologies, and ideas to fuel discussion on energy efficiency and grow engagements for NZEBs in India. I'm Deepa. I'm uh, a project uh, manager at uh, Environmental Design Solutions, and I'll be the moderator today. This webinar series is executed under the METRI program supported by USAID. METRI is an acronym for Market Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency. METRI supports three main program areas, which are energy efficiency in buildings, sustainable cooling, and training and consumer engagement. The program works in partnership with several organizations such as Energy Efficiency Services Limited, Bureau of Energy Efficiency and others to implement various initiatives. The market transformation approach includes creating business opportunities for private sector, scaling up of potential initiatives, enabling policies as well as providing training for NZ NZEBs. METRI is supporting efforts moving towards a super efficient and net zero energy target for buildings in India. The NZEB Knowledge Portal is a one-stop site for information on NZEBs. You can explore more on our website, nzeb.in. You can even sign up on the website to receive uh, monthly newsletters as well. So in our webinar today, we are going to talk about personal thermal comfort systems, also referred to as PCS. Now buildings and its interior spaces are always designed to keep people comfortable, right? It's a non-negotiable, even in the most energy efficient net zero building. Commonly, there is a lot of concern surrounding the use of resources, even indoor air quality, particularly in the more recent times. And, um, resources, particularly in terms of energy that is used to provide comfort. Now, PCS brings a different perspective to this. Throwing more light on this is our expert uh, speaker today, Professor Rajan Ravel. He's a CRDF professor at SEPT University and executive director of Center for Advanced Studies in Building, energy, Building Science and Energy, that's CARBS, at SEPT Research and Development Foundation. His research and education activities revolved around building envelope optimization, building performance simulation, thermal comfort, and architectural science education. He serves on organizing the Council of Global Cooling Prize and also on several executive boards and journal editorial boards. He's the recipient of Jeffrey Cook Scholarship by Society of Building Science Educators and is also an ASHRAE Fellow. He's also the Education Chair at the IBPSA. I welcome you, uh, Professor Ravel, to the webinar. Um, in the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes, Professor Ravel will provide background about personal thermal comfort systems. And uh, he will discuss design approaches studied by various researchers across the world in the last 40 years. He will further touch upon about research and development methods practiced by the scientific community. He joins us today from Ahmedabad. Uh, welcome, Professor Ravel, over to you. Thank you, Deepa. Uh, let, me, uh, let me start my presentation. Uh, I'm Rajan Ravel, as introduced by Deepa, and the presentation was prepared uh, by me and one of my colleagues, Vishnu, who I uh, acknowledge his contribution. What I'll be talking about is ecosystems and then uh, kind of uh, PCS and the design approaches or rather uh, boundary conditions under which people uh, should design PCS. I'll talk about that. And then also uh, how to conduct work to design PCS or what kind of methods people have used 
to design PCS. I will talk about that too. So personal comfort systems are primarily uh, the way we define is that something which is which helps us to help us to sort of mitigate certain kind of situations around us and help us make our immediate thermal environment uh, thermally comfortable the way we want. Conventionally, as you know, that the entire volume gets uh, conditioned from uh, top of the floor to the bottom of the ceiling. Everything would be homogenized at whatever 24 degree, 27 degree centigrade. And uh, this results into a higher energy consumption. Probably the equipment capacity, which you need to install also goes high because you are trying to uh, cool the entire volume at one point in time. And more importantly, you don't deal with a personal preferences of the people. If somebody is from Kashmir or somebody is from Calcutta in the same office, you might not be able to provide uh, personalized uh, pre uh, comfort for the varied kind of uh, preferences which you have. And uh, that also leads to sometimes uh, dissatisfactions among the occupants for their workplace. It doesn't really reflect upon the way they, they talk about their thermal environment, but indirectly they do talk about dissatisfaction in the workspace. And that one of the reasons could be a thermal environment which they are in. There are also, uh, nowadays we have started seeing uh, penetration of uh, radiant systems. Basically, you either you thermally activate the floor or a ceiling or sometimes false ceiling and try to use water as a medium to reject the heat. Uh, and when you start doing that, probably you might need to be a little bit more careful about how are you managing your sensible loads and latent loads. Uh, that also lowers the consumption and probably do require a little bit of relative uh, low uh, capacity of the systems. But still, you are trying to manage the entire volume as a, as a, as a unit which you want to condition. Versus what happens when you talk about personal thermal comfort systems is that you try to keep the ambient environment at the higher level in terms of if you are putting a cooling system into the place or if you're putting heating system into the place, you try to keep it closer to the outdoor conditions or you try to keep it unconditioned or less conditioned, I would say. And then you try to manage your localized environment, which we call it a sort of trying to achieve a neutral uh, comfort uh, environment. That means people don't feel cool or don't feel warm when they are in, in, the, in the, the thermal environment, which is neutral. Uh, that is what the personal thermal com comfort systems tries to do that. Uh, so what the way we say is that if you require probably 24 degree around you or 27 degree around you, you can elevate uh, ambient environment probably about 39, uh, 29 or 31. And later on, I'll also talk about how people have managed this. So that's what the uh, uh, personal comfort systems do that try to make your immediate thermal environment in the neutral conditions. When you start looking at what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of idea about how in last 30 years and from 1995, 96 onwards, various researchers have looked at the thermal comfort systems and whatever I'm going to talk about in first half of this is going to be based on about 300 peer review published, published research papers. And then later on, I'll rely on another 100 plus uh, other publications. So that's that's what I would, I'm presenting right now. And when you start looking at this, the cloud which you see on the left hand side is where most of the people are trying to manage. And that is where the air temperature, ventilation, thermal. The cloud which I made is not just a graphics, but it does have a certain kind of uh, importance. The way number of times various words been used in a literature and in focus of some of the keywords people have used. On the right hand side, uh, what you see is the approaches or, or kind of uh, gadgets or kind of hardware people have started using this. 
And personal comfort systems, the word which I'm using is personal comfort system, but many other people have used similar kind of word called personal environmental module, or uh, somebody has used a word called personal systems, or somebody has used a word called uh, 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 activated furniture and activated slabs and stuff like that. So there are various names to the personal comfort systems uh, you will find in the literature. There are three or four very significant literature work which has happened in the last uh, five years, I would say. Uh, and the work which I am talking about is primarily based on hardware and how do you really integrate hardware to provide uh, comfortable situations. But there are other researchers who also have looked at how, by using a controls, you can provide a comfortable situation. You don't try to intervene too much into the hardware, the way you supply air or the way you supply or the way you reject the air, but you simply provide controls to the people uh, and try to try to increase their uh, comfort situations. So Sam Babu from uh, IIIT Hyderabad, I think Vishal is on the call here. Uh, they have worked on, extensively on control systems uh, which you see on a one side where uh, they refer to about 100 plus uh, papers. Then there are other two papers uh, coming out of India. They talked about what are the corrective measures. So let's say if you're talking about 39 degree, the ambient, instead of relying too much on the physics, how much corrective power you can use. So what is the kind of corrections you need to do when you talk about the PCS? is also sort of discussed with the uh, Wadman and Hui Zhang of uh, CBE in their paper, where I'm primarily more talking about kind of systems and kind of boundary conditions people have uh, people have practiced. Again, on the right hand side, what you see is a co-occurrence co map that how many times people really talk about comfort or a subject or a desk or a controls and how far they are when they talk about comfort, a lot of people talk about fan, a lot of people talk about subjects, but they do not talk too much about office buildings. They do not talk too much about flow rates. They do not talk too much about seed. So this reoccurrence map, uh, co-occurrence map rather, talks about the intensity, which is, a, which is the size of that dot and how far uh, the other uh, words or other topics to, to that particular uh, uh, topic. And that's what it shows on the right hand side. And based on literature, what you can, you can define is that five ways people have managed the personal comfort system. Uh, one is only for heating and no ventilation. Second is heating and ventilation and cooling, cooling and ventilation. And sometimes, and rather many times, people simply have relied on ventilation. So just a convection just a little bit of air moving around, not conditioning the air at all, but just moving the air around the body of the occupants. That's also the approach which is widely uh, practiced. When we talk about heating, uh, the way people have managed so far is either providing a heating panels around their work desks or providing certain kind of air sleeves or garment-based heating. That means almost like a, a wearing a, 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 space shoe, a space shuttle suit when you are in office, but not in an entire, on an entire body, but just on a arms or just on a hands or certain part of the body which gets covered with the air sleeves. Also, there are certain people who have managed to work with the garments and providing certain kind of heat or cooling oil in the garments. A lot of people who also worked on palm warmers, where your palms, which really works hard on a keyboard, they remain warmer. Um, there are efforts where people have started making a seat warmer or just a feet warmer and trying to provide certain kind of uh, 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 comfortable situation to the occupants. When it comes to uh, uh, heating and ventilating uh, personal comfort systems, definitely a heating panel, but some of them also have started working on a movable panels like this, what they call it CMP, where uh, 
whenever you require you bring those panels closer to your body whenever you're not required you can keep them away or collapse them and put it on the sides uh, also as you can see some of the desk mounted or seat mounted nozzles has been provided which provides a heated air on the on the face of the person or on the arms of the person so this is where air is moving in the first one when i talk about P pcs there is no air management happening but when you talk about heating and ventilation it is supply of air and also return of air from the same environment whether it is a heated or a cooled air so that's where we classify that as a heating and ventilation uh, cooling is uh, very similar to heating panels. People have started looking at cooling, cooling panels, a little bit of uh, cooling, uh, cooling coil within the seat. This is where they used uh, uh, thermoelectric principles uh, and Peltier uh, components. They start using that uh, to, to cool the surfaces and so on and so forth. And as I mentioned, again, uh, positions of garments and air sleeves are also being practiced or rather research uh, when it comes to cooling. Ventilation, again, no, not many uh, variations other than a cooling, but uh, there are two which you can probably spot here. One is underfloor uh, air conditioner where the diffuser we placed in the floor near to the desk space is, we, some of us do consider that as a part of the PCS. Also ceiling mounted nozzle, so more like a spot cooling. Uh, the, the air flow will come only on top of the occupants and not really start distributing the air inside the volume. Also seat based uh, ventilation system and cooling system where a small SMPS size fan gets placed in the, seat, uh, in the seat and the netted seat or netted cover which helps you to get a cool air from the, from, from the diffuser which is based or rather a fan which is placed uh, at the back side of the seat or bottom of the seat. I'll show you some pictures later on about that. And when it comes to a ventilation, uh, as I mentioned, there is no heating, no cooling, but just moving of an air. Whether you place a pedestal fan around you or you put a very small USB driven uh, desk fans, which are generally available in the market, or you start providing a little bit more sophisticated diffusers in and around your body. Even ceiling fans sometimes can be called as a PCS. Uh, there are some, some of the researchers also have started providing a headrest, which, is, which has embedded device, uh, which also moves the air around a certain part of the body. Now, when you talk about a PCS, what all you need to consider while designing a PCS, uh, definitely the three modes of heat transfer, conduction, con convection, ventilation. How are you trying to cool the skin surface or how are you trying to reject the heat from the body if it is a cooling dominated space? Uh, and whether are you relying on conduction? So for example, there are certain researchers who have relied on a touch or rather palm warmer where you have a little bit of heated surface. So you rely on conduction to transfer a uh, certain kind of heat. Air as a uh, medium, which we, that's where the convection comes into picture. And when people started using a radiant panel for cooling or heating, where uh, radiation order of heat transfer gets considered. When you do that, uh, it is not just simple physics, but also thermal comfort models. Uh, generally, when we talk about thermal comfort, we do refer to a physiology, psychology, and behavior. If at all you're talking about uh, adaptive model, uh, or if you're talking about predictive uh, mean quote PMV model, you also talk about that. But what becomes very, very important is a thermoregulation model, and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in, a, in a while. They become very, very important when you start looking at PCS. You simply can't rely on three modes of heat transfer and traditional way of looking at physiology, psychology, behavior, along with the clothing and metabolic rate. But you do need to understand how our body functions, what are the skin temperature, what are the heat fluxes of various parts of the body, and how your thermoregulation takes place. So heat balance models of the body also becomes a very, very important when you want to design a PCS. So primarily what people have done in the past 
and I'm, as I mentioned, from 1995, 96 onwards, uh, there are four ways by which you can study it. And I'll detail out these four ways in the few slides. One is that you simply rely on a simulation, computer-based simulation to understand what happens. Or you can rely on a laboratory mannequin, a thermal heated mannequin or a human body or in a very layman terms, I can say it's a robo which helps you to understand the, the physiology of the person. Uh, or you rely, you rely on laboratory subjects, that means you invite researchers, volunteers to be part of your study and try to understand whether they're feeling cold, warm, neutral, whatever it is. Or in the field also, you go and talk to occupants about what they have done. These four subjects, uh, uh, these four way of uh, understanding how PCS work, and if you plot that against the conduction convection radiation, what you can see is that largely people have relied on convection. That means they are using air as a medium to cool or warm the person and relying primarily on all kinds of uh, 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 methods. Largely, it's mannequin based and a subject based. That means you have a thermal comfort chamber and work. Uh, through the chamber and mannequin and subjects to understand the impact or design of PCS. Uh, these are sort of uh, some of the pictures from the various researchers. What you see on the left side top, where you see on a uh, in, a, in that picture, you can see white foot warmer placed at the bottom. Uh, you can see small fans somewhere, uh, very, very similar to the hair dryer on the Next to the next to the monitor, so that work has happened in uh, CBD, uh, University of California at Berkeley, uh, Center for Built Environment. When the the sketch which you see bottom of that is coming from uh, Fred Baumann's study, uh, some of the Chinese and uh, Europeans also have worked. So the picture which you see with the heater on on a palm heater, that is where uh, the researchers from Denmark University has worked or Xinhua in China has worked on a USB driven fans. What you see on our extreme right, the seat with the small SMPS based fans uh, and, uh, uh, where you can get uh, a convection and you can cool your back side of the body or bottom of the body uh, and keep yourself. Obviously all of these do have their own controls with them uh, to manage the cool or uh, whatever which you require in, uh, for, for, for your comfort systems. Uh, that's work there, uh, LBNL work heavily and later on Rocky Mountain Institute also try to uh, make it marketable, this chair. And I think the picture which I'm showing you is from one of the Amazon site. At the same time, uh, other than building industry, uh, use of personal comfort system is a lot in, uh, in an automobile industry. So a lot of people work on this for the cabin comfort inside the car or cabin comfort inside the aircraft. And that's where many of these uh, methodologies is used. As I mentioned earlier, the one way of working with the PCS to work with the, with the hardware. And another way to work with is by simple controls. Um, the left hand side graph, which I'm, or rather flow chart, which I'm showing you is from research which uh, Dr. Vishal Garg is doing at IIIT Hyderabad, is not only just trying to manage the expectation of the people and preferences, but also trying to manage the building level or uh, even a grid level electricity uh, consumption. That means that if I don't want uh, 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 too much of cooling, probably I can lower the temperature and I can be benefited with certain kind of credit, which actually has an impact on a larger grid. Or if your building is a net zero building, you are not connected with the grid. And if certain uh, uh, certain occupants are do not want uh, the cool air or any, any kind of cooling, probably they can switch it off, but then that needs to be communicated with the renewable energy grid as well. That needs to be converted with something, some other uh, systems of the building. And how do you really transact that? How do you really start making that so that your grid doesn't become uh, unstable? Uh, that is where the personal comfort systems and controls comes into the picture. And a lot of work uh, happens on a control side of personal comfort system. 
So in a summary, what do you get? Uh, you get an energy benefit. Now the work, the way researchers have done, you can keep your heating set point temperature at the ambient level between eight degree and 18 degree, and still you can provide uh, the comfortable situation to the occupant where, where they are sitting. That means a personal comfort system would be elevate, uh, elevating the temperature to probably 23 degree or 22 degree. Uh, and uh, some of these systems are capable of doing that. So delta between 23 and 08 degree centigrade is where your saving is. Um, that, that means you don't need to heat up your uh, volume that much. When it comes to cooling, uh, personal comfort system has been tested where your ambient temperature remains in the range of 28 to 32, and still your PCS can give you 24, 25, 26, whatever. When it comes to ventilation, uh, it's 23 to 32 again, but some of the garment-based PCS, they also have shown a benefit where your ambient temperature can remain up to 34 degrees centigrade when it comes to cooling uh, of garment. So this is a very high level summary, but in a manner you are, you, you can expect about eight to 14 percent of savings. Uh, and while you do that, uh, probably what you need to understand is manage your skin temperatures and you need to manage your heat flux from the body. Uh, when it comes to uh, thermal comfort benefits, yes, definitely uh, more than 85% benefits at the ventilation, 75% at the heating, and about 75, more than 75% benefits at the uh, cooling. So that means that when, when, when you're relying on ventilation-based PCS, 85% uh, or more people are likely to be uh, comfortable even when you're ambient room temperature is in the range which I have shown you on the left side. Uh, there are uh, subjective subjective surveys or subjective way people have also tried to look at whether there is an increase in a productivity and a satisfaction uh, and largely what it's been observed is that personal comfort system has a very, very positive impact on productivity and satisfaction. Uh, more than that, there is no negative impact as well. Reported. People might sometimes, five, seven percent people might say that, oh, there is no difference, but none of them say that, no, this is not good for me, or they, they reject the, the concept of PCS. So that's a positive sign. Uh, there is no negative in, impact reported from the field are also from the laboratory, wherever there are subjects involved in the studies. Uh, so one of the key factors which somebody uh, who is interested in designing PCS should keep in mind. Uh, before I go on to those, a little bit of uh, recap. So if your ambient temperature is in a certain zone, um, and I just for the sake of discussion, let's say we can keep set at 23 degree to 29 degree or 23 degree to 28 degree centigrade. We call it a, that is thermo neutral zone and person is likely to be comfortable where your endogenous heat production is sort of flat, uh, you are not sweating, you are not shivering and your body temperature is sort of in a, in a, in a, in a steady state or rather in the flat curve. But when your start, temperature starts going up, you do start sweating. That's primarily because it depends upon the kind of uh, uh, relative humidity or absolute humidity you have in the air. But as a one of the unique uh, creation of a nature, one more uh, heat transfer mode we have other than convection, convection, radiation is uh, evaporation. Through the evaporation, we can manage uh, our core body temperature. So when when your temperature starts going up, you, your sweat glands gets into the action, uh, and you do sweat to keep your core body temperature uh, in a check. That at that place, your evaporative heat losses starts going up. But when the temperature drops again, uh, body has to work a little bit more on that side. So 
to start shivering. Uh, probably the blood vessels will start contracting and will do a less of heat transfer. Uh, and during that time also, we need to make sure that uh, there is not enough, I mean, that it should not lead to the stress in the body. Uh, so when we start looking at PCS, uh, various body parts which comes in a contact to the PCS in whichever manner needs to be kept in a certain range so that you don't get it's the, it should not happen that one side becomes too cold and another side becomes too warm uh, so this this is a very schematic chart just to understand that what happens when temperature goes up and what happens temperature goes down how our body uh, reacts that uh, this is a ashray uh, radiant asymmetry uh, graph where you on a, on a horizontal side you can uh, as you can see, it's a radiant temperature asymmetry and on vertical side is the satisfaction of subjects. Uh, this is this graph and I'll explain you this graph is, is applicable when your air temperature is sort of less than about 23 degrees uh, and airspeed is less than point. So that almost there is no convection taking place or no airspeed taking place. When you have a situation like that, if you have a very warm ceiling, uh, just look at what happens uh, if at a less than five degree uh, radiant asymmetry, probably 5% people uh, would be dissatisfied when you have a warm ceiling. A ce warm ceiling means the surface temperature of the ceiling is higher than air temperature of the room. But at the same time, 5% uh, uh, people can be dissatisfied when you're uh, uh, when your ceiling is cool and at 15 degrees centigrade. So as, as you can see here is that warm ceiling has a steeper curve and a cool ceiling has a little uh, uh, curve which is not as steep as what you see under the warm ceiling. So it's not just a, just a difference between air temperature and uh, surface temperature of ceiling but it is whether it is towards cooler side or whether it is towards warmer side. That becomes more important. And same thing happens that if you have, uh, if you are probably, uh, uh, when, when you look at the warm walls, you can go up to 23, 24 degrees and your 5% people would be uh, dissatisfied. And uh, last is, yeah, probably, uh, and, and when you talk about uh, cool ceiling, yeah, so that's, that's I have already talked about this. Now, in a, this, this, was, this was carried out by uh, Dr. Fanger long back uh, when, when he was very active in a research. Uh, later on, when we started looking at radiant cooling and radiant uh, heating, and especially the radiant floors and ceiling starts becoming, uh, again, uh, Hui Zhang and her team in a UCB worked on how long are you getting exposed to the cool floor or cool uh, uh, cool floor for two hours or cool for, for eight hours. So what you see on the right hand side is again that at five degrees centigrade difference uh, and if you are exposure of two hours to the cool floor, probably 5% people would be uh, comfortable or rather uncomfortable. But again, at five degree, if your exposure is about eight to eight hours, then about seven to 10% people are likely to be dissatisfied. And this is becomes very, very important when uh, people start using a radiant cooling uh, and in a floor. And I, I know that where a couple of build, couple of very large buildings coming up in India are attempting to go for a floor, which is radiantly cool. That's where this radiant asymmetry needs to be considered that uh, the, the, the difference should not be about uh, more than five degrees or so. A second way of managing uh, PCS is providing air velocity just around the body. And there is also a limits to that which, which Asher has prescribed. Uh, this is called sort of classic um, air, compens uh, air velocity compensation curve where at if you go at, let's say, on a on an x-axis, if you are at 27 degree uh, and your clothes is, that is clothing value is about 0.5, uh, you can expect 
percent to be satisfied if you provide the air velocity of around 0.8 meter per second. Uh, and the same way, if the cloth clothing value is uh, higher, that is uh, summer clothing around one, uh, you also can go up to about 1.2 uh, meter per second. That means, I mean, very roughly, if I translate, it is uh, about four set on, on our ceiling fan regulator. If you put a regulator at about four, you will generate. 1.1, 1.2 uh, meter per second. Again, it will be turbulent uh, airflow, uh, and that also is not standard because regulators do keep changing and fan speed do keep changing. But this is very, I mean, very uh, generic idea. I uh, want to give you that. That's the kind of air velocity which we are talking about. So you can provide an additional air velocity even at a higher temperature and keep people comfortable. I mean, you can go up to 31 degree. Uh, uh, and uh, provide a additional air velocity to keep person comfortable. When you start looking at a radiant in any of these, how is your body exposed to that particular element? Uh, so the view factor calculation becomes very, very important. For example, if I'm getting a uh, full air from my from the front, obviously backside of, is, of the body is not going to receive uh, convection then how much area of your body is being exposed to that condition becomes very important. And if there's a less area is, is exposed, that means effectiveness of your PC is going to go down. So, and very complex geometry of the human body and each body parts into uh, consider that what is the exposure of that to the ceiling or, or, uh, or, a, or a wall or a partition and so on and so on. So that needs to be calculated if you, somebody wants to design a PCS. Uh, also, when it comes to uh, vertical air stratification, that means floor is cool, but when you go up, if, you, if somebody is using uh, displacement ventilation, then can you have underfloor, uh, underfloor air discharge at, let's say, 23 degree, but you keep your ambient at 30 five degrees. No, that's 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 going to create a stress in the people. So if you are uh, sort of uh, standing, then the four degree air temperature difference is good enough. Uh, or if you are seating about three degree air temperature difference is good enough to, to keep your uh, PMV in a neutral zone that is 0.5 plus 0.5 to plus minus 0.5. So it basically translates into you can go for five degrees centigrade per meter from the floor to the ceiling. And if you have that much of displacement, probably you can create a comfortable or sort of neutral situation for, for the occupants. And also uh, how and which part of the body is getting exposed to what kind of conditions. This is, this is primarily very important because the sweat glands and the thermal receptors, which are just below the skin, they are not equally placed around the body. Um, there are the receptors which are which are higher sensitivity towards the cooling. Uh, their density and uh, their placement are different than the receptors which are more sensitive towards the warmer side. Uh, so that also needs to be considered when you when you start looking at the personal comfort system and especially the one which is either radiant or a convection based systems uh, we call it a thermal sensitivity which is a vote a local thermal sensation vote divided by local skin temperature so this is where i uh, earlier also i stated that skin temperature and uh, and heat flux from each body part becomes very important when you start looking at pcs so how people have studied this? Uh, there are a number of ways, very briefly I mentioned that there are laboratory studies where you simply take a measurement and I'll explain this. Uh, then there are simulation studies where you rely on computer calibrated simulation models or very validated simulation models. And third is where you go on a site and ask people about their preference or their responses on the, uh, uh, on the PCS. So when you come to a laboratory study, what typically happens is that 
you do require an extremely controlled environment. We call it thermal comfort chamber. And in and around your personal comfort system, you just put a, a measurement device where, which, which measures the air velocity and uh, the globe temperature, uh, mean radiant temperature rather, and um, air temperature and relative humidity and so on and so forth. And let's try to understand whether that personal comfort system is creating enough uh, conditions to keep person comfortable. But mind well, these are just a measurements. Uh, when it comes to a human, we are not just a sensor, but we are also source. We also generate heat and we interact with the image outside, which these measurement, a simple measurement devices can't, can't do that. Uh, but when you come to uh, laboratory studies or human subject based of field studies, what you do is that you ask people to come to the chamber and uh, take a survey, uh, expose them with the various conditions, similar thing which you do on the site. And while they are getting exposed to these situations, you also take their subjective votes. Uh, typically, we talk about how do they sense the thermal environment, that is a sensation vote. Uh, what is their acceptability? Do, are they are they fine with that environment or not? Yes or no? Uh, whether they need a, what is their preference? Uh, want to, they, do they want to be a cooler? Do they want to be a warmer? And then finally, we also talked about the thermal satisfaction. Are they really satisfied with the situation? So acceptability and uh, satisfaction becomes a little tricky uh, when when we go on a site. This also helps us understand the adaptability of the people uh, and the psychology of the people as well when you start dealing with the human subjects. But it doesn't answer many of the questions which we want to seek from the physics point of view or from the physiology point of, point of view, because people simply provide a vote and not sort of reasons behind that vote as well. Uh, when it comes to uh, laboratory studies, uh, we use a thermal mannequin, which is a thermally activated human body, like a robo, which has all the senses, uh, all the thermal senses like a human being. But advantage here is that you have a better control or better observation power over each part of the body. So what you see in the center is that uh, the mannequin, which uh, we have at our lab instead, uh, with the picture we keep on the right hand side, uh, it's been divided into about 22 body parts and how each body part is functioning uh, can, be, uh, can be observed and based on that, you, uh, you develop some of your PCS. Again, uh, there are very simple mannequin, like a simple box to a very complex mannequin where you actually have a surface to volume ratio, let's say hang, the, your, your fingers are actually like a fingers, your thumbs are actually like fingers, uh, thumbs and that's where the precision of uh, the detailed mannequin also helps. Uh, these these mannequins are uh, designed in a manner that they, I would say, across the globe, they, they very accurately predict the, the thermal transfers from the body and body parts. You can measure skin temperature, you can measure heat flux, you can measure PMV uh, of the whole body and individual body parts as well. That's where the lab-based studies and mannequin comes in the picture. And uh, the last is that all that what we do, uh, we try to do it as well on the simulation. And I won't say that which one is a better, I mean, I, we do get this question, which one is the better? And all of them are better based on uh, how, how are you meeting your objectives? So uh, uh, coming back to the, the physiology models, there are certain computer models which can talk about simple body, that how, body and body parts are going to behave in certain environment, what you see on the right hand extremes, right side, which shows that at various uh, ambient air temperatures at 26, 28, and 30, and if you have a delta of zero to eight degrees centigrade, how various body parts are functioning. And as you can see here, that head is constantly remain in a sort of 33, 32 degrees centigrade. So you can study that kind of uh, uh, work when you when you rely on a mannequin. Coming back to the thermo, thermoregulation models, some of these models just look at the body and body parts. Some of them have a capability of looking at a 
skin on top of the skin and a core because core body temperature does remain i mean it does remain same where your skin temperature keeps keeps varying looking uh, based on kind of uh, environment you are in it's called two node model and then you have a third model where you look at skin muscle and core then fourth model you look at a skin fat muscle and a core and there are multimodal also there where you don't have a limit to the nodes which you specify in the cross section of the body and try to understand what happens there all of these needs to be uh, put together with a co-simulation of HVAC, uh, how your HVAC is going to behave and what kind of system you're putting so all of them needs to be placed together with the, uh, the so thermal regulation model of a body and HVAC simulation needs to come together when you want to start looking at uh, uh, computer-based simulation studies. Uh, so where is the market and uh, where are we, what kind of things are available in the market? So as I mentioned that there are two ways of looking at it. One is hardware, whether hardware is capable of providing your heating, ventilating, cooling, or it is simply controlling the kind of existing HVAC system or improvised HVAC system you have. So hardware and software, they're both ways PCS are uh, coming into the market. Uh, very early on, Johnson Controls, and I'm saying 98, 99, or probably around that time, Johnson Controls came up with the personal environmental module. And fortunately, I could pick up the Amazon uh, screenshot also, although it says it's unavailable, but still on Amazon, Johnson Controls personal environment module is at least been shown as one of the product, uh, which basically helps you control your immediate environment. Then Air Innovation came up with the desk-based uh, air ventilation systems, along with the heating and cooling, it's called Air Command, where the same system, we just place it on, on your dashboard, and you will start getting uh, a cool or warmer air and you can you can adjust these uh, diffusers as well and uh, recently uh, we got this 911 workstation accessories from uh, one of the american company which helps you to sort of control uh, your hvac systems wherever you are working so that's that's what is uh, available in the market in terms of uh, control systems um, Vishal Garg and his team has also come up with the product, which has um, a small fan, which has a light, which has a little bit of uh, control systems also. So you just basically need to place your Android based or iOS phone on top of that module, and it will help uh, start monitoring or rather helping you to create your immediate environment, which uh, as per your preference. I think uh, the patent has also been granted in this and it's very much uh, useful stuff. I want to draw an attention uh, that personal comfort systems are not same as the wearable devices. Uh, there are quite a few wearable devices are under research and some of them are also claimed to be in the market uh, where you just simply wear certain kind of garment or certain kind of sensor on your body and it helps you to uh, at least sense that you are you are comfortable or you are warm or you are cold. Uh, whether actually they change core body temperature or skin temperature is not very much known, uh, but they at least help you to feel um, whether you are you are you are feeling I mean whatever you want to feel whether cold or warm. Uh, MIT has this startup called Restify, and you can see on the right hand side, very nice looking product. It's just a wristband which you wear it on your wrist and just start controlling your uh, sensations. Uh, University of California, Santiago also has worked on some of those which you can see on the left hand side. But again, uh, these variables are not like a personal comfort system. They are primarily made, I assume, for either uh, armed forces or for the trackers which or for the sportsmen. I'm not very sure, but probably the applicability of these in a built form, a built form environment it still needs to be uh, tested. Whatever I have talked about, not just the variables, but the PCS, uh, they are sort of in a very nascent stage of development. Um, and those who are aware about technology readiness level, 
uh, most of them them are they, they fall under TRL five or seven. Um, whether they have been tested at the system level or they have been tested or demonstrated at technology level, but a whole lot of work still needs to be designed and how to design a product like that Vistify, which you have showed you, and also the scaling it up for the production. Uh, what would be the what would be the return of investment on uh, PCS? How much energy will it save actually on site? What will the internal rate of return and so on? So if you are using it for national ventilation building, so all that will start. Uh, it still needs to be sort of studied and researched and uh, a lot more work needs to happen. So probably those who have a question regarding, regarding a return of investment and uh, internal rate of return and so on and so forth, probably I'll be able to answer this probably next uh, five or seven years down the line. Uh, so that's it from my side and uh, I acknowledge uh, the contribution from my friends, Vishal, from Italy, part of the SEPT University. Uh, let me stop here and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer that. Thank you so much, Professor Ravel. That was uh, quite an insightful presentation with so much of research going on in this area. And it's quite an interesting area, uh, right, to understand and try to see applications as well. So let's see some of the questions which have come in. Uh, I think you can uh, see some of the questions. Yes, so there is one from, uh, I think I need to look at the one which has a red flag. So let me just expand my dashboard. Okay, so one from uh, Vasuda. Uh, she's asking that can humidifier mist and diffuser uh, nozzle based also consider the part? Yes, they can be. They can be considered as a part of PCM. Whether you can practice it or not is a different case because we are talking about uh, uh, environment where you have a desk, you have papers, you have a surface, and you have computers and many other hardware around. So these mystifiers or misters rather, which we use uh, in our PDEP systems, the the principle on which they work is that you Throw the mist, and by the by the time mist comes down or near to the human being, it will evaporate the air. Hence, the temperature goes down. So, if you start using a misters as PCS, I don't know whether in a six inch or twelve inch of distance whether you will be able to diffuse this uh, into the air or not. But if at all somebody comes up with that, uh, it will be called PCS, sure. <coughs> Uh, there is another question from uh, Shivraj. He said, I wish to ask about the applicability of PCM in Indian context as ignorant about the PCS and second, how do you apply this to large thousands, ton, large thousands of tons of central AC systems? So uh, I will not be able to answer in the first question because as I mentioned in my last slide, we are still in a Five year down, five year away from the realizing PCS in the market, but it definitely can offset the large tonnages which we require in our central air conditioning systems, uh, because you don't need to maintain 24 degree or 22 degree, which you try to maintain ambient, and you try to elevate that to 29 degree or 30 degree, and uh, you can avoid some of the consumption and capacity. Uh, uh, Vidya is asking about while using PCS, what happened to the overall ventilation inside the buildings? So uh, the PCS, which are which are based on heating and ventilation or cooling and ventilation, uh, they do manage the latent load and ventilation requirements on their own. The one which does not have uh, ventilation inbuilt in that. Uh, do need to have a dedicated uh, fresh air management systems, the air, but still uh, you would be managing that air with the less of treatment, uh, not really cooling down that air to uh, desired temperature. So that's that's where probably you will save on uh, fan power and other things as well. So that's. Three questions which I could spot. Uh, Deepa, do we have any other? 
Yes, yes. We have another one um, from uh, um, you know Jaydeep. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for this information and exciting presentation on PCS. My question is how effective PCS can be in residential environment? Okay. Uh, so Jaydeep, uh, residential environment means that person is moving far more than the way uh, we see that in a, in a commercial buildings where he has to sit on a desk for longer hours. Uh, however, in, uh, in a sleeping conditions, uh, you might have observed that a lot of PCS are available in India as well, that along with the mosquito net, you have a certain kind of tent around your bed and you put probably 0.25 ton of small air conditioner in your room. So basically heat rejection happens in the room, but when you're sleeping in your bed with a single bed or double bed, at least that volume gets cooled pretty well. Um, I have interacted with a few vendors. This is very, very popular in a two segments. One is where uh, students from affluent community goes to hostels and hostels do not have an air conditioner they try to grab this and uh, transport it to their hostel. So such bed tents are available. And second is uh, in armed forces where people are being deployed in extreme climate. And they also use these tents. They're sort of insulated tents with a very small HVAC. Uh, I got a, another question from Vaidu. Uh, is there a study of effect of localized air distribution that leverage air bubble uh, that leverage latent heat of evaporation instead of convective heat or of air bubble in personalized thermal comfort. Research is going on a personal thermal comfort system which basically increases the material cost initially as required by individual person. Is a sustainability cost analysis energy savings versus material savings? Uh, thanks, Vaidu. I think. Uh, we have um, research. Rajan Bhai, those are two different yes. um, questions. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, this, yeah. I was just trying to club both together. Uh, okay, sure. So, in terms of, uh, if I if I understand the air bubble part, uh, it is possible to sort of create a localized air bubble and try to manage the latent heat only through that. There's some some work has happened in a uh, uh, university of Vasade where they're trying to do this also in uh, in the context of this contaminant dispersal and so on and so forth uh, but i'm very, not very much aware about what that solution or what the method which they have used uh, on the material front i think as of now we know that we have advantage comes to operational energy productivity and thermal comfort how much additional material or embodied energy of the pcs and what is the trade-off of that probably yet to i mean that kind of work is yet to happen and probably i can take some of the more questions from you offline by the way thanks uh, we have another question from abhishek abhilasha gupta uh, did I miss anybody in between? No, uh, no, no. This uh, is next is Abhilasha's question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just hold on. Uh, just hold on. I'm just trying to enlarge that. Okay. Uh, in personalized thermal comfort research is going to on personal comfort system, which basically increases the material. Oh, that was Abhilasha. Okay. Sorry. I read it wrongly. Okay, fine. And now uh, there's another comment uh, that is from uh, again by the Nathan is that we need to get a paradigm shift of personal cooling from building cooling for the sake of future. Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, a lot of things are getting personalized from from ages. Uh, mobile phones and computers definitely are getting more and more personalized. So I don't see why we should not personalize even our environment uh, around us at least. So uh, yes, that some, some kind of more things required on that line. Uh, we have a question from Harsh. Uh, 
are there any labs in india which have the heated mannequin to study thermal comfort pcs yes uh, we do possess uh, the mannequin at sept and uh, unfortunately you have not visited us recently because of various situation but next time when you come uh, you will be able to see that Harsh. how do you see a typical thermal simulation model software ies design builder will evolve to start incorporating the simulation uh, resolve pcs so on that front Harsh, uh, sorry on, on that front, what is happening is that presently IES and Design Builder or Energy Plus or even EPSR, all of them are thermal simulation models. Uh, they do give you uh, output as a PMV, but there are three things which are which is not possible right now is that subzonal level. So if I have one large room and how do I subdivide that room? To so many zones without increasing computing power, where I can look at the PMV at individual level. Uh, that is that capability does not exist. Second is if at all somebody can do a bit of scripting and do that, uh, they they will give you a PMV at the desk level, but that would be without a human being as a heat source. So that would be a second level where somebody should be able to put a heat source equivalent to at least 69 or whatever watts per meter square to, to know whether a person is going to be comfortable or not uh, in that space. But most importantly, what is required is there is a coupling between the thermoregulation models where you look at the skin temperature, heat flux of the body, of various body parts, and also do um, thermal modeling, which we generally see in Design Builder, Energy Plus, or IES models. Uh, along with the computational fluid dynamics. So basically, it's a core simulation which needs to come together uh, where you look at uh, thermal environment, you look at the airflow with the CFD, and you also start looking at thermoregulation models. And there are four or five thermoregulation models are available in a public domain. Some softwares are also available, but somebody needs to sort of learn them hard way, and that's, it's not very really business as usual. So. Uh, Bandana, hi. Uh, use of passive measures, indoor surface like marble stone, table tops. I mean, they can be. I mean, they 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 can add, add to uh, lowering the mean radiant surface temperature, a uh, mean radiant temperature, if they are cooler. But I won't call them a PCS because they are not been they are they're, they're active system as of now. I haven't heard anything like, a, as you are mentioning, the passive PCS. Um, but whatever what we are talking about is uh, active PCS. But yes, the cooler surfaces through a stone or warmer surfaces to a wooden floor can provide. I mean, it's like a, it's like a putting a dari on the on the cool floor. It is a PCS. It's, but most of them has been has been called as a adaptive behavior where you want to sit on a floor and you put a dari or small carpet, it's adaptive behavior. Or when you are feeling a cold or warm, you are you change your clothing level. All of them are being uh, categorized as adaptive behavior, not really personal comfort systems, because they, they're not systems per se. Even in the past, uh, somebody argued with me about uh, the hand pankha, which uh, we used to use in uh, Mughal times or even later on. Uh, which is very much part of the personalized cooling. Uh, even uh, people have try, attempted to put the jula as a PCS, where because you move on a jula and you get a little bit of air, it's a personalized way of yes. But to me, all of them are adaptive behavior, not sort of system. Uh, Pran, uh, if it is compared to the current comfort cooling systems to radiant cooling system, how much benefit? So as I mentioned, the benefit would be in the range of 8 to 14 percent. Uh, with the UFAD also, it would be uh, uh, 8 to... Now, when it comes to a more, what is more effective, PCS radiant or a UFAD, um, I would say uh, PCS is more effective. Uh, then a UFAD, but it's debatable. I mean, then we have uh, 
I mean, we are far away from uh, looking at the codes and anything to do with the PCS. So, yeah, NBCB uh, building codes are far, 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 far from any of the uh, uh, something which is happening at, as I mentioned, the TRL 567 uh, five, five, is not what uh, you try to do it with the, at the code level. So that's, uh, I think that completes the list of questions. Is that correct? That's right, that's right. Yeah. Yes, we've yeah. taken um, all the questions and uh, um, thank you so much. Those were good questions um, as well. And um, uh, uh, Professor Abel, thank you so much for sharing your insights about the research in this area. And I think it's exciting to look forward to things that are going to come up in the near future. Um, just before we wrap up our session, I have a few uh, updates on our upcoming uh, events. Uh, so just like to mention that very quickly. Our next webinar is a case study presentation of Bayalpata Hospital in Nepal. This is a net zero and low carbon uh, building by design. And Tyler Servant from Sharon Davis Design will explain the design process and all the works that went into this project. So do register for it. The link is in your chat box. Oops, sorry, one second. Yes. Uh, we welcome you to join the NZEB Alliance. If you've all not already done yet, it is a network of innovators and early adopters of NZEB concept in India. The Alliance aims to accelerate the building sector towards NZEB goals by providing an open forum for exchange of thoughts, ideas, and success stories. And to become an Alliance member, you can go on our website and sign up uh, to be a member. We would also like to feature high performing and net zero energy ready buildings that demonstrate feasibility of this concept on our website. Um, and if you've seen that there are already a lot of websites in there and we want to you know, populate that and make it more current. So if you have been a part of projects or if you're interested in showcasing a project that you have worked on or you know of such a project, please write to us at this email nzeb at edsglobal.com and thank you so much for uh, attending our webinar we hope you had a good time and we hope to see you soon in our next session on 15 december thank you